Dr. Greenhines and I don't have any disclosures uh, or conflicts of interest, and we're not going to be discussing any off-label use of, anti of antibiotics or other medications. And these are our objectives, and everybody should have been given a copy of the handout, and so they're listed right here. So I'm just going to go straight into it and start off with a question. Audience response, we don't have the electronic audience response, so let's going to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, what percentage of outpatient antibiotic prescriptions for any clinical condition is inappropriate? Here are our choices, and then I'm going to ask you A, B, C, D, or E. All right, you got a chance to read. How many people for A? No. B, 20%. C, 30%. I don't have candy. Usually I bring candy, but I don't have any today. So I have a few hands for C. What about 40%? Okay. And 50%? Are some people putting up their hands twice? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the answer is about 30%, and I'm going to tell you why. In uh, 2016, we had a study that was done looking at a national survey of antimicrobial use in an ambulatory setting. And um, of uh, about 184 million, uh, 184,000 um, outpatient visits, uh, the antibiotics prescribed was about 12.6% out of all of those visits. Of those 12.6% of antibiotics prescribed visits, just under half were prescribed for upper respiratory infections. Okay, of those upper respiratory infections that were prescribed antibiotics, half of them, only half of them were appropriate. But when you consider all of the antibiotics that were uh, prescribed and all of the visits, it estimated to be about 30% of the antibiotic prescriptions were unnecessary, uh, totaling 47 million unneeded prescriptions per year. That's a lot of prescriptions, right? Um, this is a problem of antibiotic overuse across our country, and if you look at our great state of Nebraska, um, we are not doing so great. Husker red is a great color, right? But we don't want to be Husker red when it comes to prescribing of antibiotics in the outpatient setting. In Nebraska, we prescribe about 200 antibiotic prescriptions per 100,000 per, per 1,000 population more than the national average. And so we do have quite a ways to go to try to get that antibiotic use down. I'm going to ask another question. So these are five classes of antibiotics, and which class do you think is the most prescribed in the outpatient clinics in, in adults? Okay? I'm hearing people shouting C, <laughs> vitamin Z, right? <laughs> we don't even need to do the show of hands. So, Agreed. So looking at a recently published study back in March of this year for acute sinusitis, um, I was shocked actually to see that 64% of, of patients with sinusitis were prescribed uh, IDSA recommended antibiotics. That's great. But of that 36% of people who did not receive IDSA recommended treatment, the majority of them were getting azithromycin. Okay, um, don't feel too happy about the fact that 64% were getting the good treatment because of the people who are getting antibiotic treatment for sinusitis, more than half of them were being treated for too long. Okay, so yes, maybe we might be getting it right for the conditions that require antibiotics, but are we treating people longer than we really need to? All of those are things that are important in outpatient antimicrobial stewardship. So why is it important? Because inappropriate antibiotic prescribing in an outpatient setting is a problem, and it's our problem. We can fix that problem. There are different things that we have to do. Now, the, the uh, National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria charged us in 2014 to reduce inappropriate outpatient antibiotic prescribing by 50% by the year 2020. I don't know if anybody of you guys realize that we're in 2018 right now, and so as far as of reaching that goal, maybe not, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? So first things first, we've got to take a step back and think, well, where does outpatient stewardship occur? And there are a lot of different places, and you'll see in your handout, it doesn't show up too well on this screen, but it occurs in our clinics, 
It occurs in our dentist offices. It occurs in urgent cares, um, at transitions of care between discharging from the hospital and getting into that outpatient follow-up. Um, and there are a lot of different people that are involved in outpatient antimicrobial stewardship. So when we talk about stewardship, a lot of times we talk about C. diff. We had a C. diff talk this morning, and we've had C. diff kind of peppered into our discussions over the afternoon. So I thought I would bring in C. diff into our outpatient antimicrobial stewardship talk, but not this guy, okay? The C. diff that I want to talk to you guys about is a little algorithm of um, creating your antimicrobial stewardship program in the outpatient setting. Collaboration, data, interventions, feedback, and follow-up. And this is a theme that we're going to keep following between Dr. Greenhines and myself today as we are sharing with you all of these different um, areas that we can focus on to try to create this outpatient stewardship program. So starting off with collaboration, I have another question for you. Who's the most important stakeholder for outpatient antimicrobial stewardship? Is it the doc? Is it the APP? Is it the stewardship team leader? Community pharmacist? What about the patients? Is it everybody? Is it nobody? Who is it? I think everybody's kind of nodding. Yeah, it's everybody, right? Everybody is uh, equally important as a stakeholder. So I wanted to take some time to go into who these stakeholders are. Um, so anybody that prescribes or dispenses antibiotics in the ambulatory setting, and anybody who takes antibiotics in the ambulatory setting, right? Our patient looks a little sad, right? She really wants, she really wants some antibiotics, and we need to have that discussion about whether or not they're necessary. So let's start off with our um, stewardship institution team leaders. Um, we, went, we talked a little bit earlier about what our core elements of antibiotic stewardship in the outpatient setting are. Scott touched on that. So I'm not going to go into all of the details that's listed here for you. But it's important for us to have this, uh, the antibiotic stewardship team, even though they may be located within the hospital, to still be aware of what the differences are for a stewardship in the outpatient setting, because there are things in inpatient that don't necessarily apply to outpatient. And so we need to have these discussions with what works from the outpatient setting with this team. And what's the role of the stewardship team? Well, first they need to recognize these opportunities to improve antibiotic stewardship. Okay, how can we improve antibiotic prescribing? Well, first identify some of the hot topic issues, then identify the barriers to implementing these issues, and then use all of that information to create some rules and some guidance that our pr prescribers can follow when they're uh, seeing their patients. Dr. Greenhines is going to go into all of these a little bit more detail later. So going into the people who are actually providing the care. So our physicians, our advanced practice providers uh, in the community, uh, in the uh, ambulatory setting, we need to understand what their challenges are and what are their resources to actually implementing antimicrobial stewardship? How easy or difficult is it for that clinician to be able to have that discussion with that patient saying, no, antibiotics are actually not needed at this time, okay? Uh, is there a pressure to prescribe? Are there knowledge gaps that we can fill for them? Uh, what about their visit time? Is there just not enough time to talk about antibiotic stewardship when a person comes in for a 15-minute visit and their problem list is 20? Right? And so we need to think about all of those when trying to com communicate with our clinicians how they can effectively uh, be antibiotic stewards. So looking at thinking about who our clinicians are, who are our prescribers, uh, this study published in Itchy earlier this year uh, looked at the differences in prescribing patterns of prescribers who are older versus those who are younger. And it's important to know when you're creating your intervention that perhaps your prescribers who are a little bit on the older side, I'm not calling anybody old, I'm just saying what they said, people who are over 50 uh, prescribe two to four times more antibiotics than prescribers who are less than 30, okay? And so that's important, right? It doesn't mean that you have to single people out, but maybe you can target an intervention to include more information to your prescribers in settings that we know that we have um, prescribers who are a little bit on the older side. 
Okay, so well, what about the type of training? And so the same, in the same study, we see that advanced practice prescribers uh, will prescribe 15% more antibiotics than uh, physician prescribers. So does that mean that we have to single out advanced practice uh, providers? No, but maybe we can tailor our interventions and tailor our education for specific knowledge gaps that might be present that perhaps are not uh, received in their training um, for uh, that uh, profession. So moving on to our community pharmacists, um, I think that the community pharmacists do play a very important role in outpatient antibiotic stewardship. And it is something that, you know, antibiotic stewardship in the outpatient setting is something that we've been looking at for um, a long time. And I'm gonna walk around here and not in front of this so that my shadow is like that. Um, come and give a little bit of love to the people over here on this side of the room. <laughs> So the community pharmacists are important because, you know, when we prescribe antibiotics in the outpatient setting, we give the patient the prescription or we send it electronically, and maybe we don't have that discussion with them, but what if the pharmacist can have that discussion with them at that time when they come in to pick up the, the antibiotic? And so uh, here are some, um, I gave you some references here to look at how community pharmacists have been able to collaborate with physicians on clinical disease management algorithms. So in one study, there was a um, collaborative physician pharmacist um, practice agreement where uh, the pharmacists in, in that community pharmacy would uh, treat patients for influenza and group A strep pharyngitis if they've met very specific clinical uh, signs and symptoms according to an algorithm. And what they found was well, the, the concern, well, if we have pharmacists who are prescribing antibiotics um, in the pharmacy itself, is that, does that mean that we're gonna have an addition of more antibiotic prescribing in general for the outpatient setting? And what they found was that there was actually fewer antibiotics were being prescribed because the pharmacists were following the algorithm to the T, right? I mean, sometimes, you know, us as physicians, we see the patient and yes, we know what the algorithm is, but we might say, well, I don't know, maybe we can give this person an antibiotic. Um, and, you know, when you say, okay, I'm gonna charge you as a pharmacist with this particular algorithm and this is how you follow it, and if the person does not fall within that algorithm, then you send them over to be seen clinically, there's gonna be less of the um, ambiguity of treating somebody that does not have, that does not meet the criteria. And I think that's something that in, in our uh, clinical, clinical setting as clinicians, we could stand to kind of utilize some of that practice as well, uh, especially in the outpatient setting where it could be really useful and very time um, sensitive. Um, and so pharmacists can also provide just-in-time patient education. So people would come in and they have symptoms of urinary tract infection, and they can counsel patients on what exactly the symptoms of urinary tract infection, this was in New Zealand, um, that um, they should be concerned for needing um, treatment. Um, and if they did not meet those uh, specific symptoms, then counsel patients, what can you do? Can you take more fluids? Can you, you know, what are the other things that you can do? And here's why antibiotics are not needed in this clinical situation. But what about the patient? We spent a lot of time talking about the providers and the pharmacists, and these are all people that in their little environment are talking at the patient. But what can we do to help the patient feel empowered? As they are very important, and actually I would think uh, the bigger part of who needs to be involved in this discussion. So look, knowing exactly who your patients are and who is, at, uh, who is more likely to get antibiotics can help you create an intervention to see how you can help change some of the uh, ways that patients get antibiotics. And so it depends on where you live. Looking at a city like Omaha, this was a, that same study from um, uh, Itchy, um, but say we applied this to uh, Omaha. Um, the patients who would be seen in a city clinic, you know, maybe at the med center or something like that, would be more likely to have a uh, antibiotic prescribed than those who are going to see their rural doc, okay? Why is that? I don't know. 
And so this is, a, this is a situation where we can say, okay, how can we look at those two individual practices and see why are these patients not getting as many antibiotics? Is it because the patients in the rural areas don't go to the doctor as much? Maybe. Is it because they um, just uh, the physicians or clinicians who are in the rural areas um, have sort of more of a authoritarian approach with their, their with their patients? Like, nope, you do not need antibiotics. Do not argue with me. You will not get antibiotics, <laughs> right? I don't know, but would it be helpful to? see whether or not there are some of these differences and maybe apply that then to the urban area where we have more antibiotic prescribing. Similarly, looking at the race and socioeconomic standpoint, um, does that have an effect? So we see here in that same study that Asian and African Americans have a 15% lower risk of being prescribed antibiotics. Why is that? Is it because they don't go to the doctor as often? Or are our physicians or clinicians actually making conscious decisions not to prescribe them antibiotics? We don't know. And so thinking about all of these areas where some implicit bias can shift the way uh, antibiotics are being prescribed, if we can utilize this knowledge and try to mine that information to see where we can take successes and apply them to areas that are, have deficiencies, then we may be able to make some inroads with our outpatient stewardship. Okay, so looking at, um, we, I spent a lot of time on the collaboration because I think it's really important to, to make those relationships uh, for you to create an outpatient stewardship um, program. But the other thing that we need is data, okay? And data is something that is really difficult. I was sitting at, the, um, at a table at lunch and we were talking about how easy or difficult it is to get data for outpatient stewardship and for, for long-term care facilities. And it's just really hard. Um, what do you guys like to use? Like, what do you think is the most important or most useful metric? Is it indication specific, drug specific, microbe specific? prescriber specific or you know is there something else that people are using we can just kind of like do I do let's shout, let's shout it out a a anybody for B drug specific is that helpful for people not really I'm seeing some okay microbe specific can we even have can we get that data it's not as easy to get microbe specific data in the outpatient setting what about prescriber specific data is that is that helpful some nods okay so, I, like um, Brunuga said, I am um, pretty active on Twitter, and a couple months ago, we, I participated in a Twitter chat on outpatient antibiotic stewardship, and um, uh, SIDP asked the very same question to the Twitterverse, and people were pretty much agreeing with you guys, you know, indication-specific uh, metrics are really important and really useful. Um, so, we looked at our indication um, specific metrics here at Nebraska Medicine, and I just wanted to show this to you. For um, acute bronchitis, um, we looked at the antibiotic use, and we can see that, you know, I would expect, based on the guidelines, right, this is where the line is supposed to be, right? It's just, we're not supposed to be using antibiotics for acute bronchitis, but here we are. Right, and so this is an example of how we can actually have both indication specific and drug specific because within now this class, within the syndrome of acute bronchitis, now we can still even more pick out the ones that are being overused. And again, here we go, vitamin Z, z packs is right up there at the top. And so if we are able to at least distill down our information in our data to what indications are people are prescribing antibiotics for and how frequently are this, they are prescribing these antibiotics, then we can perhaps use that information to craft our interventions. I'm not gonna go too much into details on the metrics. I created this table here for you and it's present in your handout on some um, advantages and disadvantages to those different approaches to uh, um, studying your antibi antimicrobial stewardship. And so um, at this point, I'm gonna give the mic to Dr. Green um, to talk about interventions and feedback. And I'll come back at the end. All right, so to 
Ooh, excuse me. To carry on the C. diff algorithm here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about intervention. So I think when you've been tasked to become a leader in antimicrobial stewardship, um, either in the inpatient or outpatient setting, it can be really overwhelming to know where to start, um, as has been discussed in previous uh, presentations. And that's because there's generally a lot of um, opportunities for improvement. Um, so thankfully, the CDC has um, given a, or outlined some steps that we can all take um, when we start to think about how to develop interventions uh, for outpatient antimicrobial stewardship activities. Uh, so step one, they suggest to identify conditions in which clinicians commonly deviate from best practices for antibiotic prescribing. Okay. Um, so these you can think about um, through your data that maybe you've collected, um, or uh, sometimes it, I think it's helpful if you're in a smaller institution, just think anecdotally. What, what can we improve on? Um, so let's talk about some of those um, examples of deviations. Um, so it may be a condition in which antibiotics um, are overprescribed or not indicated. So we've discussed things like acute bronchitis, nonspecific URI, or a viral pharyngitis in which antibiotics would not be indicated. Um, it might be conditions in which antibiotics are indicated um, but are overdiagnosed. So we've talked a lot about asymptomatic bacteria today and the fact that urinary tract infections are overdiagnosed. Um, and in my own practice, so in my pediatric ID clinic, um, we see a lot of patients who have been diagnosed with recurrent group A strep pharyngitis. When going through their history, it's, it's apparent to us that they um, have symptoms more consistent with recurrent viral infections, um, and that when they're getting swabbed and cultured, uh, their pharynx is getting swabbed and cultured, um, the positive group A strep test is more consistent with colonization, which is very common in pediatric populations. Um, so other deviations from be best practices um, may be conditions in which antibiotics may be indicated, um, but they are uh, the wrong antibiotics are being given or um, at the wrong dose or duration, as Dr. Marcelin has talked a lot about. Uh, azithromycin is very popular antibiotic to be prescribed in the outpatient setting, and I think that's probably because back when we were actually writing out prescriptions, um, that it was very easy to write for, um, and patients really, it was really easy for them to take, um, and so then they started asking for it. Um, and so uh, certainly azithromycin has its place um, in certain uh, infection treatments, but um, it is not always the most or, um, best antibiotic to be given. Um, and then there may be conditions uh, in which watchful waiting or delayed prescribing, antibiotic prescribing, may be appropriate. And so a prime example um, of that, especially in the pediatric world, is acute otitis media. Um, and so in certain pediatric populations, it may be appropriate to just uh, watch the ear. Um, and again, that, that would require follow-up um, instead of giving antibiotics from the get-go. Okay. So step two, the CDC recommends that we identify barriers that lead to deviation from, from the best practices. Um, and so our best laid out plans aren't going to work unless we address barriers to those plans, okay? So potential barriers um, may be knowledge gaps. So it may be that the um, clinician just isn't aware of the most common etiologies of bronchitis, right? Which would be viruses, not bacteria. Um, it may be that there's a perceived pressure to see patients quickly, and I think this is a really important barrier in the outpatient setting. There's a lot of pressure to see a lot of patients in a very short period of time. Um, and that can be a barrier to appropriate antibiotic prescribing. Um, there may be this perception of patient expectations for antibiotics, um, and we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, and the, we all know the pressure is real, right? Patients want antibiotics. Um, and there are certainly concerns about decreased patient satisfaction. So um, we are well aware of patient satisfaction scores. I don't think anyone's immune from that these days, like it or not, and those patient satisfaction scores become very uh, transparent in this day of social media. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, time constraints and at least what I've learned on how to 
try and attempt to overcome this barrier in my own practice. Um, so we think it's helpful to start a conversation about antibiotics and appropriate antibiotic prescribing um, before you even see those patients, before you see patients. Um, and so, so one way to do this is to um, have information on antibiotics and appropriate antibiotic prescribing in the waiting rooms and exam rooms. Um, so at Children's Hospital and at Nebraska Medicine, we have these electronic bulletin boards, um, and it's kind of a revolving bulletin board or a billboard, so different messages can be displayed throughout the day. Um, and so through antimicrobial stewardship, we've posted different messages about antibiotics and um, uh, the, um, antibiotic stewardship in general on those bulletin boards, electronic bulletin boards. If your organization doesn't have this, um, good old-fashioned posters work as well, okay? And the CDC actually has a lot of great um, resources that you can just print off for free. Um, so you can print off a poster for free from the CDC um, and post it in your organization. Um, there was a randomized clinical trial in adult primary care clinic setting where a poster size commitment letter um, for appropriate antibiotic prescribing, um, it included the clinician's photos and their signatures and the statement saying, we are committed to prescribing antibiotics only when necessary. Um, so this poster was posted inside of exam rooms, um, and this uh, measure was associated with a 20% reduction in inappropriate antibiotic prescribing rate relative to the control where no posters were posted. Um, and so I think that's, that can be helpful, okay? Um, I think it's also helpful to try and clarify intentions before the physician or other clinician even enters the room. And so even in my infectious disease clinic, if it's not really clear um, maybe why the family is there, um, I will have my nurse, when she goes in, ask the question, what questions are you hoping to have answered by the doctor today? Um, and sometimes that, I think we need antibiotics. Um, and so then I can really prepare myself before I walk into the room um, and kind of rehearse my, okay, not, a, not everyone needs an antibiotic um, little speech um, before I walk into the room. And it really, um, uh, it saves time, right? So you don't have to dance around this whole um, trying to feel the family out or the patient, you know, out. And then you've got, you've got your spiel ready. Um, I think having uh, patient and family reading material ready is also helpful and can save time. Um, and so it depends on your electronic health record. Um, but ours, we can have these kind of pre-populated phrases um, that I use all the time for different things. Um, and it may be, hey, your kid has a recurrent viral infection, antibiotics are not indicated. So I have this whole kind of um, paragraph ready that takes me a second, literally a second, to, to create, um, and I can modify it as needed, um, and it gives a lot of education to the families that I'm, I'm going over in the clinic, but if they um, forgot something or have questions about it later, they can have something to refer back to, okay? Um, I also use a lot of educational out handouts on different infections, so you can, anything from acute otitis media to histoplasmosis, you can find an, a, a good educational handout on, um, either through the CDC or, or the other hospital and clinic organizations, um, and that's, that's very helpful. Okay, so true or false, if a prescriber perceives that a parent desires antibiotic therapy for their child, the prescriber is more likely to prescribe an antibiotic. This one's easy, right? True, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so there was a uh, survey study performed with 10 private uh, practice pediatricians that explored how during sick visits, uh, parents communicate their preferences for antibiotics to their child's physician and how those physicians perceive this pressure. So they found that any parent-initiated statement of antibiotics, whether that's a direct request, so a parent saying, I would like antibiotics for my son, or an indirect mention, something more, a little more passive-aggressive, like our next-door neighbor's son has the same symptoms and he got an antibiotic. What do you think? And that's actually more common than this direct request. Um, so either one of those types of statements increases the likelihood that the physician perceives the parent as expecting antibiotics. That makes sense, right? Um, this perception of parental or patient pressure has been shown to result in increased overprescribing of antibiotics in this study and multiple other previous studies. 
Um, but what this study found is that physicians are actually not very good at predicting what parents or patients actually expect. Um, and so I think that's why it's helpful to me, at least, um, when I maybe assume that a family wants antibiotics because they're here at an ID clinic, what else would they want, right? Um, that's why it's really helpful, it has been helpful for me to have my nurse ask that question before I even enter the room. Uh, so let's talk about patient satisfaction. Is it possible to have satisfied patients and still do the right thing? Um, so there was a cross-sectional study conducted on over a thousand pediatric acute respiratory tract infection visits, looking at both positive and negative treatment recommendations. So positive treatment recommendations are essentially explanations on what parents can do to help their child's symptoms. So something like a statement that, like, you can give ibuprofen to make her comfortable. Um, and then a negative treatment recommendation um, are explanations of the inappropriate of antibiotics for their child's infection. So something like, this is caused by an, a virus, so antibiotics won't help. So what this study sh uh, found was that positive treatment recommendations with or without negative treatment recommendations are associated with decreased antibiotic prescribing and combined positive and negative treatment recommendations are associated with the highest possible visit rating. So again, it is possible to do the right thing and still have very satisfied patients. Um, the study that I discussed in the previous slide also showed that parents who expect antibiotics but did not receive them at the time of visit were significantly more satisfied uh, if the physician provided a contingency plan. So something like, the possibility that antibiotics may be provided if the child did not improve in a certain period of time. Okay, so after we address potential barriers, um, the CD suggests that step three be to establish standards for antibiotic prescribing. So lucky for us, we don't have to come up with these for, from scratch. Um, so there are uh, many different national clinical, clinical practice guidelines can be found at the IDSA, the CDC, um, and very pediatric specific guidelines at the, at the AAP. Um, and many of these are applicable in the outpatient setting. Um, there's also facility-specific um, clinical practice guidelines and pathways. Um, so as has been mentioned, uh, Nebraska Medicine has several outpatient um, clinical pathways for infections, um, and these are public for everyone to use. Um, and Children's has them as well. Unfortunately, they're not yet public. Um, we're working on that with our legal department, so stay tuned for that. Um, in the meantime, you can refer to other um, pediatric hospitals who have made their guidelines public. So some of my favorites are Children's Hospital Colorado and Seattle Children's. Okay, let's talk a little bit about feedback. Um, so true or false, providing peer comparison for antibiotic prescribing practices can reduce inappropriate antibiotic prescribing. I know we're short on time, so the answer is true. Okay. <laughs> okay. So there was a randomized clinical trial conducted among 47 primary care practices in Boston and LA um, where clinicians received zero, one, two, or three interventions for 18 months. Um, so these were suggestive alternatives to antibiotic treatments. Um, so something if like a URI diagnosis was made, entered into the EHR, um, a pop-up screen within the EHR um, would uh, uh, triggered and, and suggested the alternative management was given. Accountable justification um, prompted clinicians to enter pretext justifications for prescribing antibiotics. Um, so when they prescribed an antibiotics, they actually had to type in why, um, and then it would say justifiable um, text was given. If nothing was put in, it said no justification given. So that was all visible within the patient's medical record. Um, and then peer comparison was an email-based intervention um, that sent emails to clinicians that compared their antibiotic prescribing rates with those of top perf performers or those with the lowest inappropriate prescribing rates. Um, they all received some antibiotic prescribing guideline education at enrollment. And what they found is that the two socially motivated interventions, so accountable justification and peer comparison, Peer comparison resulted in statistically significant reductions in inappropriate antibiotic prescribing. Um, so within the children's organizations, um, children organization, um, the outpatient general pediatricians have adopted um, this peer comparison. 
Um, so they've adopted recommendations for first-line antibiotics for acute otitis media and sinusitis, and there's clinical pathways for each of those as quality incentives. And so reports are built within the pediatrician's um, EMR dashboard and that looks at the use of amoxicillin or augmentin as first-line therapy for acute otitis media or sinusitis, um, with some exclusions, of course. Um, and each of, of these lines represents a different clinic within the organization, um, and so it's very transparent. So you can look at individual clinics, and then if you click on the clinic, you can see the actual physicians as well, and can even look at the patient list, so can look at their, the, what patients fell out. Okay, and quickly we'll go to follow-up here. Okay, so uh, follow-up is actually pretty um, short. So the thing is, with uh, any intervention that you do, whether you're in the hospital or outside of the hospital, you need to be able to sustain it, right? And so that's the premise of follow-up. And so what I wanted to share with you guys was uh, what happens after interventions are stopped and whether or not we can figure out the nice sweet spot that we can use to get our antibiotic stewardship program going in the outpatient setting. And so this particular slide looks at um, a study looking at broad spectrum antibiotic prescribing before, during, and after audit and feedback. And audit and feedback is a great intervention in the hospital. Um, uh, Dr. Van Schoenveld talked about that. And um, even looking at how amazing audit and feedback is to reducing uh, inappropriate antibiotic use, once an intervention was discontinued, actually trends went back to where they were um, at baseline. And so what that speaks to, this is the reason why our, our inpatient antibiotic stewardship program is ongoing. We can't just decide to stop, right? <laughs> because this happens. And so the same thing uh, has to be applied for outpatient antibiotic stewardship. And this next slide has three other types of uh, interventions that um, Dr. Green Heinz talked about was the accountable justification, peer comparison, and then the suggested alternatives. And again, we see that when the uh, intervention is stopped, then we can see a trend back towards um, baseline, okay? So this is normal for us as human beings. We make change and then we slide back, and then we make change and then we slide back. Notice though, you guys remember back to the morning when Dr. Srinivasan was talking about that peer comparison and how um, type A and competitive we are. This is something that was drilled into us in medical school, right? These doctors always want to be the best at whatever it is that they're doing, including not over prescribing or prescribing inappropriately. So peer comparison was the only one that after stopping they still want to be the best, even if you stop telling them that they're the worst, they still want to be the best because they can hear you in their head, right? And so that's something that I think um, speaks to uh, perhaps a usefulness of this particular intervention in the outpatient setting. We still need to figure out how we can put everything together and be able to identify how to give the individual prescribers what they need. That was my last um, slide, thankfully. Just wanted to reiterate what the success successful outpatient stewardship requires. And you know, you can email us, our email addresses are there, and uh, you can shoot me a, a note on Twitter and I'll be happy to chat with you guys.